most of the time that I was out there, I was what they call a resident vis visitor. I was given a resident status and, and the right to come in and, and use the lab and the equipment. And I, I didn't pay for it and I wasn't paid for it. But then I, for, with the Hal Alice system, then they actually hired me because um, they needed, you know, the, to program and to compose for that one. And, and so I, I did end up getting hired and paid. With Hal Alice's synthesizer, there, there were two other rationalizations that permitted me to be actually hired and paid. One was that nobody is a better test for a real-time interactive digital system than a musician. We put out more kinds of information in more different ways than just about any other kind of user you could come up with. And the other was that it was the 50th anniversary of Talking Pictures and the Motion Picture Association in Hollywood had requested the labs to come up with something for the anniversary of the jazz singer, the first real talkie, which had, the sound had been done by Western Electric, which was became part of Bell Labs. So um, we were the originator of sound for film, and um, we, we worked like crazy, and we got a hell of a demo together. And this world-class, very first, ostensibly first real-time digital synthesizer, and all flew it out to Hollywood and demonstrated it in front of, you know, there's like Robert Wagner and Olivia de Havilland and a lot of other people who what on earth is that? You know, sitting in the audience and, and thinking, this is some kind of glorified organ and not having a clue about the state of the art technology and all the many patents that had come out of that instrument. There's a, a piece up on YouTube that's had quite a few views of me playing that instrument using interactive software that I wrote for it. In um, C, um, when C was still a brand new language under development, and the hardware was under development, and the compiler was under development, and the operating system, Unix, was still really new, and you just never knew when something didn't work, if it was hardware, the, wasn't working or, or a bug in the compiler or they had just changed the compiler in a way that no longer accepted the code that you had just written. Um, it, it was pretty crazy and we were under a very tight deadline because this thing had been scheduled at the Hollywood Palladium and they put this thing up on a big revolving platform unbeknownst to us, un and, and of course it's got all these cables that connect it to, and, and this thing starts rotating, and they, they managed to stop it rotating just before all the cables would have snapped. It was just like such an adventure. God, but um, we got it, it, it talked, it simulated, it, it, it was a general purpose signal, signal processor that could do lots of stuff, but I, my job was to come up with music. It was still very easy, relatively easy, to create sounds that had simply never been heard before, sounds that could never have existed before. It was all new. On the other hand, you know, those of us who did that took a lot of flack. We were coming out of the period when computers had always been the sole province of unfriendly parties. I mean, the military had them, the insurance companies had them, the phone companies and large utilities had them, the government had them, but individuals didn't have computers yet. There were no personal computers. They had a very dehumanized and, and menacing persona to the general public. 
If you remember some of those 50s sci-fi films, like The Forbin Project was, was, was one. Computers, you know, that could take, at, at HAL in, in, in 2001, computers were intelligent beings who were likely to totally want to destroy humanity. Anyway, so we took a lot of flack for dehumanizing music. Uh, computer, the idea of using a logic-based system like that to create what had always been an intimate, personal, human expression was com completely incomprehensible to most people. And it, it was very hard to convince people that this was a medium capable of, of being an absolutely wonderful, creative medium of expression. Then, of course, there was this major revolution and increasingly throughout the 70s, where by the end of the 70s, you got the Apple II, their own personal computer at home that they could do stuff on, and that was an absolute revolution. It was a real counterculture, the personal computer counterculture. It was an alternative culture. I mean, Timothy Leary thought later when he had an Amiga that that was like that the computer was the next generation's version of LSD and the surest path to enlightenment. I, I, I got to hang out with Timothy Leary actually a bit during that period. He was totally out there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, once people started being able to have them, it was just an amazing transformation.